I'm Elizabeth. And together we serve the church charge of Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Bennett and Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove, North Carolina. Whether you're part of our churches or just found us on the net, welcome, friends. As for announcements, our administrative council meetings for both churches have been put on hold due to the circumstance of schedule, and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we know anything more about when we can meet. Do you have any other announcements? I do, I do. Uh, for Mount Zion, they are collecting recipes uh, to put a cookbook together, and if you want more information, please contact Megan Fry. And also for both churches, uh, we have the CUOC need. And for those of you who are not familiar with CUOC, it's Christians United Outreach Center. And our local facility sends us a pantry need once a month, a food need. And for Mount Zion, your food need for the month of March is Chef Boyardee. For Pleasant Hill, the month of March need is spaghetti noodles and sauce. However, we were supposed to have a quarterly food drive on March 15th, which of course we didn't have. And the list is canned meat, instant grits, canned potatoes, oatmeal, canned fruit, and canned protein beans. And if you need that list, and if you'll email either one of us, we'll send you that list. And that's all the announcements that I have. Okay, sounds good. Count me in, when's dinner? <laughs> Uh, this worship online is new to us and it is not something we planned, but a little bug called Corona has certainly got our attention and caused a lot of shifts in the way that we're thinking and doing ministry. Um, I know we're all thinking about the changes and the social distancing and all of that. Um, yes, we all have concerns over people out of work mm -hmm. and daycare issues for families, uh, whether our High school seniors are going to graduate on time, and what's going to happen with the children in school who don't have online um, things that they can use, and seeing our loved ones, and um, our normal everyday things that we take for granted, such as sports on TV. Oh, really? <laughs> well, you're right. We still have a lot to learn about where this is all headed and certainly enough to pray about. About today's worship, um, today's topic is all about God's kind of love and how we can trust him and serve others while we're trusting him. A few heads up for today's worship. Uh, first of all, have your Bible open, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and also Ephesians chapter five in the New Testament. For uh, times of singing and prayer, your words will be on screen and if you have children in the house or friends, uh, gather everybody around the screen together, especially the children. There'll be a message especially for them. If you plan to mail in an offering for the church expenses, uh, there'll be an address at the end of the worship service on the screen for you to copy. And also there'll be an email address if you care to send prayer requests because we will be praying for people during the service. So. If you uh, need to prepare, hit the pause button, go get yourself a cup of coffee and your Bible, and welcome. Worship begins now. And would you like a cup of coffee? Oh, absolutely. Okay. with anticipation. Accept our worship from hearts offered to you freely in response to your loving care and faithfulness. In the name of Christ, amen.
to receive your gifts online just yet. But if you would care to support this ministry, let me encourage you to take your check and place it on your open Bible as we pray together over this stewardship. At the end of the message today, there will be addresses that you can send in support of either church, Mount Zion, or Pleasant Hill. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the gift of stewardship that helps us express our love for you. And Lord, help us to be faithful in that stewardship, to give as you direct us. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for all gifts in our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. about this virus and about people getting sick over it and what's going to happen, uh, if you're afraid of the unknown, and certainly we all are, you can ask your parents, you can talk with them about this. The second thing I want you to know is that God also cares for you and God cares what happens to you. He loves you. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, um, a whole bunch of snakes one time attacked the people and people were getting really sick and actually dying. They didn't have vaccines back in those days. They didn't have the kind of health aids that we do, but they were dying and God told Moses, their leader, to put up a pole in the wilderness with a bronze snake on it. Not a real snake, but one that looked like a snake. It was made of bronze. Whenever the people would look to that pole, they would be healed. Now the lesson here is that God does want us to be healthy and he's willing to help. And our part is to look to God, our healer. And we do that in two ways. Sometimes we go to the doctor because God uses doctors to help us. But secondly, we always pray. Pray with me today. Father, we thank you that you give us doctors to help heal us. And we thank you, Lord, that we have people working on a vaccine for this coronavirus. We thank you, Lord, that our parents are interested in helping to keep us from being ill as well. And so we pray, Lord, that we would cooperate with you by going to the doctor when we need to and also talking with our parents about it and about all of our fears, not just about sickness. Lord, we thank you that you love us and you do want us well. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we join in prayer together, perhaps you want to take the hand of somebody that's in the room with you and just agree in prayer together. Let's join. Our Father, we're thankful for 
the opportunity to pray and connect with you. Lord, we're in this second week of uh, self-quarantine with uh, the COVID-19 virus. And Lord, that's on our minds, it's uppermost. It's a concern that we have for so many people and for ourselves. And Lord, we, uh, we ask that you help us to slow down, to not be fearful and to reconnect with you. Lord, we pray for those in our churches. Mount Zion Church has been praying for so many people. Lord, we pray for the families of um, Danny Frazier. Danny? We pray for the family of Beverly Hawkinson. Family of Beverly. Lord, we pray for Corey Witten. Corey. Winfred Dixon. Winfred. Carolyn Engel. Carolyn. Ted Bean. Bo Frazier. Bo. Cleo Brown. Cleo. Lord, we pray for those who are homebound and in nursing homes, Robert and Betty Kibben. Robert and Betty. We pray for Kathleen Brown. Kathleen. Charles Gatlin. Charles. Linda Brown. Linda. Margaret Brown. Margaret. Larry Davis. Larry. And Betty T. Betty. Father, we pray for uh, loved ones that are halfway around the globe, Samantha Clem. Sammy. We pray for those who are recovering from their grief, Amy Brewer. Amy. We pray for our military, Zachary Miller. Zach. Peter Wilkin. Pete. We pray for Chris Clem. Chris. Lord, we pray for the Christians United Outreach Center as they minister to the physical and emotional and spiritual needs of those in the community. We pray for CUOC. CUOC. Lord, from our church in Seagrove, Pleasant Hill, we pray for those who are sick or in hospital, Debbie Sutphin. Debbie. We pray for Abigail Hawk. Abigail. We pray once again for the family of Beverly Hawkinson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. We pray for Rick Halo. Rick. We pray, Lord, for those who are homebound or in nursing homes, Ruth Adams Ruth. and Harold Ray. Harold. We continue to pray for Samantha Clem. Sammy. We pray for Josh and Renee Moose. Josh and Renee. We pray for their ministry. Lord, we pray for our president and all of our government, both national and local. We pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon each leader as they lead us through these perilous and tumultuous times. Father, for all of this, we pray that your love would shine in us so that we might be courageous and that you, Lord, might be glorified. Lord, we lift our hearts to you, we lift our lives to you. We ask, O oh God, that you would bless us and use us in your service. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, How can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. 
When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son, Amenadad, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemia, and Samuel said, Neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he is out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, This is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. And our, our New Testament reading is from Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is the word of God for the people of God. leads us to one of Christianity's greatest statements. The Apostle John's Gospel contains what's been called the greatest verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This verse is learned in Bible school. It's quoted often in sermons. It's even hung over the guardrails in football stadiums during the Super Bowl. I even heard of a man who changed his name legally to John 3.16. So I'd like for us to think together for the next few minutes about the omni qualities of God. Omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. These three O words take us through a grand sweep of the nature of God. He is the all-powerful, that's omnipotence. He's the all-knowing, omniscience. And he's the all-present one, omnipresence. He's the one the Bible calls God and the Creator. There is nothing because of his omnipotence that strength can do that he cannot do. There is nothing of which he is ignorant because of his omniscience, whether it's past, present, or future. There is nowhere to which you can ascend, descend, or hide from his ever-watchful, omniscient eye. He is God. 
And these characteristics of God are not an exhaustive list. We could add a lot more to that list. He is faithful, he is truth, he is eternal, he's just, he's righteous, he's long-suffering, much more. Now, it is a natural thing to connect God with the idea of love. Human beings have fallen far short from that image. There was a grandmother who was going shopping with her daughter and two boys. The children had discovered a new word to use when they were upset with each other. As they started for the stores, they suddenly became angry, angry with each other. One said to the other, I hate you. The other said right back, I hate you too. Well, the mother said, I'm certainly not going to take two little boys who hate each other to McDonald's for lunch. Five-year-old Jamie quickly backed down. He said, I really don't hate you, Billy. Billy, with the clear logic of a three-year-old, responded, well, I still hate you. I'm not hungry. I hate you. Three little words, so much a vitriolic picture of an embittered life. Human hatred has always been something of a paradox for me, but the opposite of hatred or love has been stronger and longer lasting. It's the message of John 3.16, the day that God said to my heart, I love you. What is the meaning of that love? That's the subject we want to deal with this morning. As with any word, people can perceive a different meaning. If I ask you to come to my house for dinner, some of you might show up at noon. Others might show up at six o'clock. It depends on what time you're used to connecting with that word dinner. For instance, if you eat liver pudding in Randolph County, you'll eat scrapple up north. Same stuff, different word. There are different meanings for the word love as well. There's romantic love, the kind between a man and a woman. There's brotherly love, which we have for our friends. There's also parental love, which we uh, love our children with and love for our pets. There's a whole host of uses for the word love when it comes to appreciating things or food or sports. Uh, we could say something like, I love my job. And it means something different than what my cousin means when he says he loves his Mercedes. In the 1960s movie, uh, Love Story, Ally McGraw turned to Ryan O'Neill and said, love means never having to say you're sorry. I call that love drivel. And then there's the king, Elvis, who wanted the ladies to love me tender. So when it comes to talking about God, what kind of love are we talking about? Somehow Elvis and the rest fall short when we begin talking about the kind of love that God shows us. So I want to give us a working definition of love. The word in scripture is agape, and it literally means this. God's kind of love is an unselfishness which results in doing the best for another person, even at the highest personal cost, without requiring or expecting payback. Now, frankly, it's difficult for us humans to get our minds around that, how to to understand how God or anybody else could act in somebody else's best interest without expecting something in return. God loved us with agape love in spite of some things, in spite of his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresent. Let's dig into these three statements. Statement number one is God loved us in spite of his omniscience. Omniscience is knowing everything. There was a pastor who visited an elderly couple for dinner, and during dinner, the husband always talked so sweetly to his wife. Every time he addressed her, it's, sweetheart, pass the butter, or dear one, would you please get me some more coffee? Thank you, love of my life. <laughs> when the wife went to the kitchen, the pastor said to the husband, Bob, man, it's wonderful that after more than 50 years of marriage, you're still calling your wife by all those sweet, wonderful, endearing names, love sweetheart, pumpkin. The husband said, well, preacher, actually about 10 years ago, I forgot her name. Can you help me out here? The point here is that God knew us and he knows us and he's forgotten absolutely nothing about us. He knows everything and yet he still went to the cross for us. That is love. That's agape, the unselfish love of God that did what was best for us. Paul put it this way in Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. 
The Lord knew everything about Russell when he was hanging on that cross. He knew all of my sins. His omniscient knowledge covered all of the wrong things I'd done in my life, as well as things I'll mess up in the future. He even knows the sins that I wanted to do, but haven't had the time or the energy to do. Yet he considered me and he died for me anyway. The love of God is tied to the omniscience of God and that God knows everything about everybody. He not only knows the bad stuff that we've done and the good stuff we've been commanded to do but have left undone, God knows our trouble. He knows when the world is beating us down and feels like it's just time to give up. He knows when you're at the breaking point. That is why he went to the cross for you and me. So God's omniscience, he knows everything about us. He still saved us. A second statement, he loved us in spite of his omnipotence. Omnipotent, all-powerful. He can do with strength whatever strength can do. And yes, the question, how exactly is this tied to love? Well, what relationship do love and power have? It has to do with the cross. I've heard a lot of gospel songs over the years that state this very well. One has a phrase in it. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, but he died alone for you and me. He stayed on the cross. The reality is that Jesus stayed on the cross despite having all the power in the universe at his disposal. Had he chosen so, he could have ended everything in the entire cosmos with a single spoken word, a single thought. He has that power. But the scripture says that he loved you and me by dying for our sins. So he loved us in spite of his omniscience, knowing all about us. He loved us in spite of his omnipotence, able to come down off the cross. But statement number three, he loved us so that we could join him in his omnipresence. Follow the love of Jesus, if you will, in these few verses. In Titus chapter three, it says, but when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Inheritors. If Jesus is the Son and the Father makes us heirs, what relationship does that make of our relationship to Jesus? Brother, the Lord wants us to join him as brothers and sisters in his omnipresence. Now, I know that physically we cannot be everywhere at once. That's impossible in our flesh. Sometimes when I've got folks in three different hospitals in three different cities, I'd love to be able to do that, but that's impossible for me. However, with the indwelling Spirit of God active in my life and in your life, we are somehow joined with fellow believers everywhere. We bring the ministry and the love of the omnipresent Lord Jesus as salt and light around the globe. Think of this other verse. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says it this way. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought also to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's a tall order. Tony Campolo tells a story about Joe. He says, Joe was a drunk. He was miraculously converted in a street outreach mission. But before his conversion, he gained a reputation as a derelict, a dirty wino from whom there and for whom there was no hope. But following his conversion to Christ, everything changed. Joe became the most caring person at the mission. He spent every day there doing whatever needed to be done. There was never anything that he was asked to do that he considered beneath him. Whether it was cleaning up vomit left by some sick alcoholic or scrubbing toilets after the men had left them filthy, Joe did everything with a heart of gratitude. He could be counted on to feed any man who wandered in off the street. He would undress them and tuck them into bed uh, when they were just too out of it to take care of themselves. One evening, 
After the mission director delivered his evangelistic message to the usual crowd of sullen men and drooped heads, one of them looked up, got up, came down to where the altar was and knelt and began to pray, crying out to God to help him change. This penitent drunk kept shouting over and over again, Oh God, make me like Joe! Make me like Joe! God, make me like Joe! The director leaned over to him and quietly said, Son, wouldn't it be better if you said, Make me like Jesus? After thinking about it for a few minutes, the man looked up with a questioning expression on his face, and he asked, Is he like Joe? Is Jesus like Joe? Is he like Russell? Is he like any of us? That's really the question, isn't it? That is the question, and the answer is yes. Yes. Multiplied a thousand times, yes. The Lord Jesus Christ loved us with his dying and his resurrection, so that we would join him in his omnipresence, in touching the world, around the world. The omniscience, the all-knowing of our Lord did not keep him off the cross. Another one of those gospel songs says, he knew me, yet he loved me. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. The omnipotence of our Lord would not let him leave the cross, even though he was all powerful. He possessed the power to take all of my sins and give me all of his forgiveness and righteousness. And the omnipresence of our Lord Jesus is my joint inheritance and yours. We go everywhere as the church of the living Christ to heal, to bind up the brokenhearted and to bring the ministry of reconciliation to those who are sick and wounded and imprisoned and marginalized and lost. Jesus is an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present and all-loving God. He offers us eternal life. Beloved, that is not just for when we die. It is the opportunity to immediately experience the power of his death and his resurrection and to walk in the power of his coming by participating in his omnipresence as part of the body of Christ in this world. The whole point of Jesus telling the disciples all he did about the love of God was to make the point about the invitation of God that we can be changed. We can have God in our life. In the few verses preceding our text of John 3, 16, Jesus had told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again from above. The new birth is the cornerstone of resurrection theology. God did not come and die just to give us a symbol or to show us what a nice and loving God he is. He didn't come and be born in a manger to give us a warm, fuzzy reason to send Christmas cards and give presents to each other. He didn't come to just be the best moral teacher the world has ever seen. God came in that manger. God came for that cross to bring the resurrection power that would allow us to be reborn. Jesus coming out of the tomb on Easter morning is all about new starts, new beginning, new birth. The words of Jesus invite us to come to the light. The Lord Jesus is that light of the world. As we come to him in humble confession and repentance for our sins, there's something which the light does in us and to us and through us. There's a change. Jesus called it being born again. Jesus said that that was necessary. Matter of fact, he said, ye must be born again. To do nothing about that is to reject his free offer of grace. It's to dry up the cleansing of any baptism. It's to trample on the cross. It's to say, I don't need a savior. But for those who will come, there's a transformation and it's waiting for us. Ye must be born again. Ye can be born again. Simply in faith come to the cross, repent of your sin, Place your faith in Jesus Christ, and ye will be born again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let it be so in each of our lives.